to the cloud and I'm going to set our screen so let us adjust uh, the presenter up here to make it look the best and uh, with that Nick I'll introduce Nick as our, as our president and our CEO for those of you that, uh, that have seen Nick here before QDMA life member dear Stewart graduate long before he ever came to us so uh, he was one of us uh, before he got to draw a paycheck from here so uh, we are super proud uh, to, to have him uh, leading the charge here for those of you that uh, that don't know Nick, hardcore deer hunter, habitat manager, he is uh, he is QDM through and through. So the perfect guy to uh, to kick off this and to share uh, all the cool stuff that's happened. So with that, Nick, go ahead and take it away. I appreciate that, Kip. I got to admit, I was a little depressed to even listen to myself there for a second when you were apologizing for the uh, for the for the report that I do, but. Uh... Uh, no, I, I do appreciate that very much. And uh, good evening, everybody. And I will zip through this quickly because I am also very eager to hear what our friend Mike has to say, because as part of my habitat management, apples are, are part of it. So uh, looking forward to that. So happy spring. It is habitat season. Uh, it's also shed hunting season. And also uh, yesterday, as I was driving home from the property I was working on, I saw a double bearded gobbler. So it's turkey season coming up. Uh, just kind of a cool, cool time to be out with the world coming back to life after a, after a long winter, at least in the neck of the woods where I live. So um, uh, as Kip said, I also uh, get into to property management as well. And so I, I was pretty exhausted last night. Many of you may also have some sore muscles this time of year, but it's a labor of love and that's why we're here. And that's why we're here learning about it and uh, looking forward to it tonight. Uh, in terms of our branches, we have we still have a, a lot going on. I looked at what I talked about last month, and I look at this month, and as Kip said, it's always changing. There's just a ton happening. Uh, and so uh, current, current events in terms of branches, we created and finalized our custom label NDA event group fundraising site. Uh, so we'll continue to do our virtual and national branch fundraising on this custom site. You'll be seeing a lot more from event group here. Uh, our branch portal has, has been completely overhauled. Uh, this will be a great resource for our branches to have 24 seven access to the different forms, logos, guides, et cetera, uh, that you're gonna need. This will be updated regularly. And I can tell you that today I also got my own login. So uh, it is alive and, and moving forward. So be sure to check that out. Uh, we've also updated our branch policy and procedure guide uh, and also our event guide. We created a new branch fundraising toolkit uh, and all of these are available in that branch portal that I just mentioned. So again, be sure to check that out. Uh, we're working on a preferred vendor program. Uh, this will also be for our branches. We're working with our current sponsors, partners, uh, and other companies to offer a program for our, van our, our branches to utilize their fundraising events. So again, just trying to make life as easy on you as possible. That was a big commitment we made as we were uh, talking about the merger uh, several months ago. And I, and I hope you feel like that we're sticking to that. Uh, we created a volunteer steering committee. We'll continue to meet with that group on a monthly basis, formed a new branch uh, also in Chatsworth, Georgia. So another new branch. This is, uh, you know, as I was writing my, my president's message for the next issue of the magazine, which we're, we're working on right now, I talk about the idea that this isn't the time to sit back and say, well, we have enough branches. If, you, if you're thinking about wanting to be part of a branch or even starting a branch in your area, please do that because we'd love to have you. This is a, this is a time for growth. Uh, we have several branches that are currently conducting or getting ready to conduct the, some uh, fundraisers. So uh, it's, it's that time of year. We've got a lot going on. Uh, on from a policy perspective, uh, mission-related work, we, we have a new chronic wasting disease roundup page on our website. If you just go to our website, the easiest way to find it is in the search. Uh, just type CWD roundup and we give you uh, a list of all of the issues related to CWD that are happening across the country. I recognize that's not a fun or exciting subject and a lot of us when we go looking for the news we're not looking for the bad news but it is important to keep yourself updated on what's going on. You might even find something out that's going on in your own backyard so check that out. Uh, and, and speaking of chronic wasting disease we've worked on CWD legislation in Minnesota and Mississippi since you've last heard from us. Um, we've done some deer population management policy work in Iowa, forest management in New York. Uh, we've sent out 25 action alerts uh, since they're already this year. So that's about, just to put that in perspective, that's about one every three days. So we are incredibly active on the policy front. Uh, we were doing, having fun talking about the habitat management and all the work that we love to do. I'm pretty confident most of you don't love to do the policy stuff. So we are out there doing it and I want to make sure that you're aware of it. So uh, again, one out of every three days is, I think, is pretty impressive. Uh, you know, but ultimately, 
Uh, you can find that on our website, but if you're not a member already, uh, we, we obviously want you to be a member, but also you can at least sign up for our free e-newsletter that comes out every Thursday. And a lot of these things are also in there as well. So I, I'm hoping that most of you that are hearing this, it's kind of old news because you've seen it already. But if not, please sign up for that newsletter, become a member, and you'll get all this. A couple other things around the organization before we throw it over to Mike. Uh, we've got a new hunter landing page that's at deerassociation.com slash new hunter. So be sure to check that out or send people that, that could be or would be new hunters to that page. It's a great resource for them. Uh, we worked at the National Shooting Sports Foundation uh, and Daniel Defense, and we did an industry-related Field the Fork event, and we're going to have a video coming out on that soon. Uh, you'd be surprised at how many companies that are even right within our space, the outdoor space, the shooting space, that they've got many employees who are not hunters who have never hunted. So we actually will do field to fork events in those cases to get those people into the outdoors. So uh, look for that video to come out. Uh, and then finally, I want to I want to mention we just opened a senior level position within our organization called uh, senior development officer. And so if maybe it's you or maybe <clears throat> excuse me, maybe you know somebody who would be a good fit for this position. That job description is available on our website. Uh, when you go to the about section of our website, just look for employment opportunities. And again, that's senior development officer. And that's going to be a very important position for us going forward. So be sure to check that out. With that, I just want to thank everybody again for being here. Thank you for your support. Uh, as always, if you have any questions, you can reach me directly at nick at deerassociation.com. And I hope I do hear from you. So with that, I will get out of the way and we'll turn it back over to our guest of honor here. I'll take a, I'll take a second and, and introduce Mike, but uh, something about the advocacy you just mentioned, uh, Nick, even I get to see them all as they're coming out and I'm, I'm, I'm impressed by that number, even though I'm seeing them as they're coming out. And I think for folks that are listening, you may not see all those because if you're in a specific state, you'll only get bumped or dinged when your state has an action alert. So if you're interested in the, in the volume of stuff or really the breadth of the topics, you can always go into our advocacy link, which is on the Deer Association's website and just look for uh, policy and advocacy under the conservation menu and every action alert is posted there. So one more that, thing too, Matt, when yeah. I heard your voice, I thought Matt's going to yell at me. I need to mention the Southeast Deer Study Group meeting. Oh that we just uh, that we just wrapped up here. Um, extremely successful. We had just under 400 attendees. Uh, some of you, I recognize some of the names on here this evening that made it to that meeting. We've gotten excellent feedback. And so um, I hope you had a chance to see that. I want to congratulate our team for hosting that event and, and particularly uh, Matt, who was the, the chairman of, of seeing that event off. So um, we think we, we, we know uh, hearing from our guests there that they were pleased with it. We, we feel like we did a pretty good job with it. And so, uh, again, I want to, I want to congratulate our team on the great work there. So back to you, Matt. Thanks, Nick. It was a team effort for sure, including the, everybody on this, uh, on this panel. Uh, so without further ado, we're, we've chewed up some of your time, Mike, we're going to let you run with it. Uh, let me introduce Mike so you guys know who's, who's coming at you. Um, Mike's, Mike's an employee of the National Deer Association, but he's much more than that. Uh, I met, first met Mike as, a, as he was a volunteer. I actually started as a volunteer myself. So uh, we're both New Yorkers. We both started as volunteers and eventually were crazy enough to take jobs with this organization. And uh, Mike started out start, uh, with a branch. He was a branch uh, president out of Rochester, New York. Uh, I think I met you first at one of our Deer Steward courses. You eventually went through Deer Steward 1 and Deer Steward 2. Um, at the Deer Steward 2 class that Mike was attending, by then you may have been an employee, uh, eventually becoming our regional director. Maybe not. I'm trying to remember. But you were there, and we actually had somebody slated to speak on apple trees and fruit trees, and it was something that you were doing a lot of Uh Interestingly, that person had a, uh, a traumatic experience in their family and he couldn't make it. So we lost a speaker and Mike raised his hand and said, I think I can cover that for you. And we said, well, what are we going to do? We're all there. Uh, everybody had traveled in. 
um, it's, it's a topic that neither Kip or I felt super comfortable talking on. We said, okay, Mike, Mike has more experience. And he blew us away what he talked about with the crowd there that day. And uh, ever since then has become our in-house expert on fruit trees. I'm really excited to, to, and now today, Mike has been with us for a number of years as a full-time employee. He's our assistant director of grassroots, um, co-director with uh, Josh Hilliard. So they cover all of our branches and work with all of our volunteers, all the stuff that Nick just mentioned with our uh, website and steering committees and the branch portal, that's stuff that Mike works on. And, uh, but he, he loves and has a passion for apple tree management and you're gonna hear all about it. So Mike, I'm gonna turn it over to you and let you run with it. All right, Matt, I appreciate that. And that was a Deer Steward One class. And that was when I was still a volunteer way back when, but we're all getting older, we'll just skip past that. So I'm gonna try to share my screen here. And you guys, you guys got me? We, we got good? you, Mike. All righty. So the good news is I have some time to make up, but, you know, I talk fast. I'm from New York and this is going to be on YouTube. So you can slow me down there. So, and this is going to be a general overview. There's so much here to try to cover this, you know, in our time slot is, is really impossible, but there's a lot of opportunities here and you're going to learn some things. Um, see if we can get the PowerPoint here to work. There we go. So spring is around the corner. I still have snow on the ground, but you know, winter is here. We're starting to get the meltdown. It's gonna be 60. So we're starting to think about all things related to, to habitat. Really the focus of the talk is gonna be looking at the overall, uh, you know, getting apples, you know, trees selected out and getting them in your property. It's definitely an investment. There's a lot of money, time and sweat. And of course, we're gonna talk about planning sites and the planning process. That's gonna be our really our focus here today. It's definitely investment. And I always tell people we're gonna talk about habitat no matter what, and most of you know this stuff, but the lowest hole in the bucket. It may not be for you, but maybe you're interested in growing something. You wanna learn something new, absolutely do it. So you should know it's very expensive and it's also extremely time. -curve. However, it's very rewarding, addictive. Deer obviously love apples. And if done right, it can be definitely a focal point for deer on your property. And that's kind of what I've, I have noticed in my experience planting apple trees. So we're gonna talk about single trees versus orchard planting. When I talk about orchard planting, we're gonna be talking in blocks of 10 to 30 trees. And obviously orchards, in my opinion, provide a Grand Central Station point. Obviously it's food driven, but think about the structure of an orchard that promotes deer activity and behavior. There's a lot of branches, there's structure there, you know, there's lots of scent going on. It's just, it's just a place where deer love to come and it's just natural. And plus there's some really good food there. And I just threw some information here with the apple, 95 calories, mainly carbs, and only one gram of protein. So certainly not, you know, the, uh, the best thing, but certainly adds some, some value. Many benefits to having apple trees, not only for the deer, but for you. A bushel is about 42 pounds. My trees now average 10 bushels plus a year. My trees have been around, I lost my notes that actually when I planted the dates, um, so going back and looking at photographs, I believe it was sometime in 2009, maybe 2010. Um, so they, they've been in the ground for a little while, but um, I had apples probably, and I would say impacting my hunting around year four or five. And that's based on rootstock, variety, and then also your training methods that you can use. That's what's going to get you there. You just can't stick the tree in the ground and think everything is going to be really good for it. So when we talk about sites for planting, again, I really like blocks of trees. Singular trees scattered across the property is fine. You're going to add some diversity. You're going to add definitely things for, for a habitat feature, and you're going to be giving some benefit to wildlife. But, you know, there's a lot of maintenance involved. So depending on if you don't want to, you know, be across all your property, all times of the year, checking and working on your trees, and you actually want to have a draw from a hunting standpoint, you know, or a great place to hang cameras, a great place maybe to hang a stand. Better if you can put it between bedding and your orchard. We all know that, you know, pressure and deer, how they can certainly scatter out of the area. You know, there's nothing better than having a block. And I think 10 to 30 apple trees is key. You don't have to get any bigger than that. You know, I, I've had great success with, with deer movement and activity and also from a hunting aspect with my trees. And currently I have, I think, 27 trees. Um, I didn't start all 27 at once. It was kind of a progression over a two year period. And then I threw a couple more in. I love inside corners of, of, of field edges. I love edge habitat transition zones, diverse habitat types. I like to have the orchard in that area. We're gonna talk about the sun and your location because that's key as well. 
And of course, you want to really consider things about wind with your stand site access, and of course, the travel patterns between known, or maybe you're going to develop some, some bedding onto your orchard. How is this all going to play together in your test match against deer? And it doesn't have to be just for hunting. You can just do this if you want to grow apples, of course, or just add something out there for them. But most of us, you know, like to try to use some tools to make it a little bit more successful on the hunting end. And of course, firearms and archery. I am primarily a bow hunter. I do firearm hunt quite a bit, especially now with my involvement with Field of Fork. But you want to think about those things before you just plant your orchard in a spot. You really want to think about all of those those aspects. So when you're going to talk about you know your site considerations, an apple tree at least needs eight hours of full sun. So this is just a simple sun diagram. And obviously we know the sun comes out of the east and it's going to set in the west. But just remember you can't have any tall shade trees on the eastern or southern or western sides. That's really important. So I do have some trees on my western side, but the, the my apple trees don't start until probably a good 40 feet out from that edge. And the trees that are in, in the first 10 feet of the edge are more early successional and there's an old wild apple tree in there. Not a lot of shade right there. So you really want to consider your site with the sun. Other things is airflow. Airflow is going to be your friend in preventing disease. And obviously in general, places where you have good sun, you're going to have good airflow. And I mentioned frost, you know, if you're going to be in the low, low valley or whatever, frost obviously is going to drop. So frost kills flowers. Flowers are going to be your apples. So I like to have a spot that's on a good plateau. And mine is actually, I think my orchard is about 1400 feet and then probably a thousand feet or so it drops down and the bottoms out at 1200 to 1100 feet. So the cold air, you know, when I'm up at my house, you know, is a little warmer when I go down to here, I don't really notice any difference, but when I drop into town where that where the definite low spot is, it's obviously colder. And also remember any early ripening varieties, you know, they're gonna flower earlier. So they're gonna be more prone to frost. So here's my site, the picture on the left, the X marks the spot. That's the site that I chose. My place used to be an old potato farm way back in the day. So I didn't really do a lot of things with my property my first couple of years. I just hunted it and I decided to take really good notes and what was happening, what I saw. I had way too many deer. I had, I had browse lines like you would imagine. So we focused a lot on, on does. And my my transition into QDM for myself was a little bit of a, a slow one at first. My first year, I just hunted. I had been away from hunting for a couple of years, got back into it, learned about QDM, got involved with QDMA, and obviously was extremely passionate in the program. And I have seen amazing results. But I was really slow at first, those first couple of years, planning, thinking, learning, sucking it all in. And that, I think, is really key to anyone that's just gotten a piece of property. And that's what I always tell people when you first get a property, really think about it, take really good notes. I have stand observation, Matt has seen it help me run some stats before to make sure I'm doing it right. I have stats going way back when, and it's really helpful to see the quality and, and just the deer numbers and stuff. So we concentrated a lot of does. We started off doing some food plots and apples one was one of the early thing. The picture on the right just shows the corner going around from that road on the left, just kind of where it's in. It's kind of an inside corner and it's worked out really well. You see, you can see. So there's definitely some trees on the west side, but not enough to cause really any shade. You'll see some shade in one of my photos. I don't know what time the photo was taken, but I've had no issues whatsoever. So just to give you a little overview. And here we go. We're fast forwarding. This is from 2013. I know this photo is, is from that. So you can see my orchard here in the middle. Um, and then this, this year I planted corn. This was some, um, I think both plots were clover. This may have been clover and possibly some brass because I can't remember that year. But uh, just to give you an over, overview, you can easily see my orchard, my spacing of my trees. I use stone for mulch. We'll get into that in a little, a little bit here. And here's another picture from just showing the inside corner just to, so you can get a visualization of what I've done with my, my property on, on this piece. This is in corn. I don't plant just straight corn anymore, mainly because of the maintenance involved. Um, with corn, you know, I don't have a chopper. I have a brush hog, but just the thatch that's there. I've enjoyed soybeans. And uh, this past year, I've, I've mixed it in a little bit. Other things you want to have, obviously, you want to have well-drained soils. Avoid heavy clay. Flat and fertile is good. Apple trees do not like wet feet. So really having a good drained soil is, is, is key. And you want to have sandy loam if you can with a pH of 6 to 6.7. This was actually pulled from last year, a soil sample. I just marked clover because I'm not sure. I don't think what, I think, uh, biologic here with mossy oak really does apple tree uh, soil testing, but I am able to get the pH is what I was really after. 6.3, so I'm pretty good. And actually, I, I limed last year. And liming is extremely important with, with apple trees. Think about all the fruit and rot that's happening there. It's extremely important. So just like all my food plots, I treat my apple trees the same. There's some other analysis you can do with leaf analysis of apple trees. I spent some time with some folks at Cornell. I actually almost got into the apple business. 
um, spent time with Cornell, went around to some, some commercial orchard, learned a ton there. I also learned a lot from my good friend, George Clifford from Florence, Vermont. We wrote an article, um, Apple Addiction, I think it was back in 2012. Lindsay would have to maybe correct me on that date, but he and I became very good friends, hunted a lot, enjoyed a lot of time, worked on apple trees, both at my place and his place, just became really good friends and shared a lot of good ap apple knowledge. And that's kind of how I became where I am now. Climate considerations, you need to know that varieties have different chill hours. And this gets very common. There's, I've even seen some things that are written that are kind of play the two different things. But just know that most trees and varieties, they need a certain number of hours between 32 and 45 degrees. And it's chemical balance to make sure that the hormone responsible for dormancy breaks down. Check with your local extension office. Check with your nursery about this variety. If you're, you know, working with a, a local nursery um, for your trees, they're, they most likely are going to have trees that are that are perfect for you. But you know, guys in the south, my experience is all up here in the north in New York, which is apple country. So, the things you just want to consider about those chill hours. It's something I'm not, not going to go into. It's extremely complex, but I would definitely check with your extension office and your nursery. We're also going to get into these topics, and each one of these literally could probably be a half hour to forty minute talk. So. We're gonna cover some rootstock, varieties, diseases, planning and initial care, deer, pest, deer and pests, weed control, station, spraying and IPM, which is integrated pest management. And I've learned all that stuff from Cornell. They have excellent resources. And those are some of the links that I gave to you guys. And we're gonna to touch on pruning and training. Um, you know, pruning and training is highly important, highly complex, but we're gonna to, to touch on that a little bit. Lots of questions generally when we get that kind of stuff. This is uh, also compliments of Cornell, just to show the tree anatomy on things that we're gonna talk about. You know, we're gonna talk a little bit about central leader when we're talking about pruning. We're gonna talk about some shoots and some spurs. The spur is generally where you get the most fruit. So we talk about pruning and what we wanna do there. We can get into this now, because this is a really great picture. In general, new wood or wood that's two to three years old is gonna give you your best apples. It's generally from these, these uh, short woody uh, shoots that are called spurs. That's where you're gonna get the most quality fruit, especially on the commercial side of stuff. Um, the other thing is the graph union. That's extremely important when you're talking about your planting depths. So we'll get into that a little bit as well. But you see the central leader going from the roots from the union graft going all the way up. That's your central leader. Then you have the branches coming out and then you have spurs coming off from that. So just keep that in mind when you're, when you're going through your, your plans with your apple trees. Spur stock is extremely important. I can't stress this enough. It think it's the foundation, you know, it's your cellar, it's it's the feet, it's, it's the characteristics of the tree. It's extremely important. It determines your growth, disease resistance, cold tolerance, anchoring characteristics, time, how long is it gonna be for apples? Some rootstocks can take 30 years. I don't know about you, but I want apple trees a lot sooner than that. And hardiness, it's extremely important, extremely. I'm just gonna get a quick drink. So, we know that age matters and so does rootstocks. And this is a picture of just 10 feet outside of my orchard. And I'm just absolutely Unfortunately, we did see him, um, we did not harvest him. And the little guy on the right, he definitely got a pass from me. But uh, again, I put this in here just to remember rootstock is very, very important. You got to purchase from a reputable nursery. I, am, I have nothing against box stores or anybody else that's trying to make a living out there. However, they tend to sell two things. An apple tree that you don't know the rootstock on, or even worse, a B9, which is a dwarf tree. Those are intended for the folks that want to have a home garden. It's going to get maybe nine feet at most, and it's meant to be completely enclosed for the life of the tree. It's great if you want to have some trees around your house, and I would definitely get some B9s on Honeycrisp, because that's my favorite apple, but you definitely don't want to get a dwarf tree when you're talking about for wildlife. So, and I think that's where some guys make, make a little bit of a mistake. They might go buy a box store and they see a sale on trees and they just they can't help themselves. I, I, I understand. So I'm that way with gear and some other things. So I made this, this chart for you and I understand you may want to see it. So I know the chats have been dropped. Um, my email is going to be dropped. If you guys want any of these things, just reach out, Mike at DeerAssociation.com. I'd be happy to show it to you again. It will be on YouTube. But this is a chart and we're going to start off with a standard size tree. Everything on based on rootstock is based off from that and a standard apple tree is about 30 feet. So I really like M111s. I also like M7s and B118s are, are, are okay. I think M11, 111 is probably the best and M7 is adequate. I've had success with both. I have a lot of good M7 apple trees down there and you can see that they may need more support based on my chart. But I've had good success for them. 
what is key here is when you get your, your root stock, you need to think about how big this tree is going to grow. And then we're going to plant it. Now, obviously, if you just wanted it for apples and nothing to do with habitat, you need to know those space differences. So these are just rules of thumb. And I went on 16 to 18 feet on my trees. And you saw my, my lines on my trees. They were up and down and across, perfectly square, not really, but pretty darn close. And I did that for multiple reasons. I knew the rootstock of my trees. I knew how much they were gonna grow, how bushy they were gonna get, how much limbs were gonna come out. I'm thinking about maintenance that I have to do in my trees, thinking about pruning, training, mowing, spreading lime, fertilizer, and actually hunting. I'm a bow hunter. So I do have an archery stand pretty close. I have two of them. They're very close to each other. They're just angled differently. And I just hunt them based on what I'm seeing from some of my intel when I'm hunting. So, you know, I wanna have trees that are not far apart because I want things to be condensed from a hunting standpoint. And I have also other things that I've done with my property, but I wanna think about hunting aspects and also just the, the growth of the tree and the maintenance involved. So in general, these are just rules of thumb. So also hardiness, as you can see, you know, M M7s are, are listed as moderate. I've had no issues. We've had some extremely cold winters since, since we've uh, had these in the ground, no problems. You know, the M111 is saying moderate and I've had no, issues whatsoever. And then you work over your disease resistance. And I put some notes on here. This is extremely important because this is gonna help you have less problems down the road if you get the right one. So you can see that it's resistant to these, these things. And uh, we'll talk about more of these things later on. Um, but this is extremely important is your rootstocks. I can't stress that enough. There are some other good rootstocks out there. Um, I would say you're probably gonna find M7s and M111s pretty fairly easily. With the exception, you're gonna to have to order your apple trees extremely early, and we can talk about that as well. So this is a graphic that was actually in the Quality White Tails article that George and I did. In the white is everything that I have planted. Now, Honeycrisp doesn't have a lot of good disease resistance, but I planted them. George actually had some extras and said, hey, you want some? I said, sure, I can drive six hours to Vermont and spend the weekend and hang out in the orchard and bring some trees back. So that is what I did. Um, there's some really good notes here. You know, maturity date is when the apple is gonna be ripe. And then it sort of coincides with some apple drop. There could be some variance depending on pests and other things, hail, rain, wind, um, actually even varieties, you know, gold rush. If we walk down on my orchard right now, there's probably still a gold rush hanging up there and all mush in my tree. But this is just a general thing. And you can see there's a lot of good resistance to, to some of the problems that happen with apple trees. So I would highly recommend looking at this. You can talk with your, your nursery or if you, if you happen to shop online with some good, there are some good apple uh, nurseries online as well. They have a lot of good resources there and try to, to see what's going on here. In my opinion, Liberty is by far the easiest apple tree to go to grow for the novice. I think it is extremely good. I think it's got some great disease resistance. It's got some easy training principles and I think it's relatively easy to prune. The apples actually taste fairly well. Um, I've had really good luck with Liberty. So again, those, those are the ones that I have. The Crimson Golds, um, I don't really don't like the taste of those. They're fine. The deer obviously love them. Enterprise is a really good um, apple. Gold Rush is a cross between an apple and a crab apple. Deer love them. They hang forever, but it's a late dropper. When I pick my trees, I tried to pick some, some, some varieties that were going to start dropping early in the season and drop late in the season. Not only from a hunting aspect, but I'd like to provide some, some munchies through the course of time for them. That's what I'm interested in. That was my, my approach there. We talk about diseases, pests, and problems. There's some primary issues we have to worry about. Fungus and bacteria, where the bacteria is mainly going to be fire blight. The tree eaters, the insects and the mammals. Frost drought, and of course, us with lack of maintenance. And you can see this nice black bear. Um, this was all clover all the way through. The other side, another half was corn at that time. And I started off, you'll see some pictures, but I actually did a block enclosure. So he didn't actually get in there. Obviously, if he wanted to, he would have. But, uh, but it's really cool to see, see the wildlife on the property. So. We have, I have bears every year here in Western New York. I could have shot one this year, but I just got it on my, on my cell phone because I just appreciate them and I've, I've taken a couple of bears. So, um, but they can be problematic for apple trees. So I had to chase one off uh, a few years ago. Maybe it was last year. Um, I have a trail camera picture that you'll see. Fungus, things such as crown and root rot, sooty blotch, cedar apple rust, that's pretty common. You'll see that. I have a little bit of that here and there. Uh, powdery mildew, I had one of my trees that had powdery mildew on it. And I don't know why. It only had one tree. It kind of stunted the growth. Finally, we got we had it taken care of. Um, so you can see that over over to the right corner. And the uh, cedar apple rust is in the upper right hand corner. Uh, and then some scab. You can see it on the leaf, and then also on on the apple. Now the deer are going to eat that apple, and they're not going to really care. But these things can cause problems with fruit drop and other issues with your trees if left unchecked. So. 
The bacteria, basically fire blight, that's what you're thinking. It's a gram negative bacteria. You can use copper applications and ceratomycin. I have not done that. Check your local laws. Um, I would check with your extension. Um, but the basic thing you want to do is cut your diseased wood out of there at any time. Get rid of it when you see it. And you need to dispose of it properly. And if you see this, you want to clean your pruning tools or have separate dirty tools. And I'm still away from of alcohol afterwards because you, you can transmit this stuff. Um, so it's extremely important to understand if, if you're getting some, some fire blight. A great resource on, on uh, some varieties and also some uh, pests and, and uh, diseases with apple trees here from Cornell. And now we're gonna get into the insects. Um, this is a big issue with, with apple trees, more so on the commercial side, but still can be an issue for you too. So there's aphids, there's tree borers, which is the one there that I got the arrow going to in the middle of the screen that actually bores into the tree, can kill the tree, can cause other issues. Coddling moth, leaf hoppers, leaf rollers, mites. PC, which is the beetle I got there. He's actually made that cut. She is lay, lays the eggs. And then the picture on the right is the tree that actually has when the eggs hatch. That's kind of what it does, it scars the apple. They're long gone when the time that it's gonna drop or be ready, but it just looks like an ugly apple. Of course, the deer do not care. But PC is definitely a, a big, big problem. And of course, Japanese beetles and tent caterpillars can cause issues as well. And of course, there's the little bear that tried to get into my apple tree. And actually I had a cell camera down and this was this summer. Now that I see that picture, it reminds me based on what else is on the ground. Um, I got the cell picture, it was lunchtime. So I ran down there and, and shooed him off. So he wouldn't damage any trees. So we're gonna talk about some window base at the screens. We're gonna talk about stone as mulch, for, uh, some fence enclosures, and then posts. I use posts and we can talk about that. I don't think I have any photos, but you'll get the idea. And I put those up to prevent any bucks from, from damaging my, my trees from rubbing the uh, the central leader. Pre-planting tips for you, you gotta, you gotta order your trees early. There may be some good nurseries around you that, that really have quality apple trees and they may have them, but I have found um, it difficult to find apple trees um, if you don't order early. So check with your nursery to see what they have. And if they don't have it, try to order it now for next year. Or if you're going from somewhere else, the same thing. You can't do it early enough. Usually a year at a time, depending on what you want. If you want a honey crisp for yourself, it's extremely hard to get those, especially on dwarfing rootstocks, just because they're they're probably the hottest apple on the market, um, just for a commercial side. Get your soil samples. Try to get that pH between six and six seven. Pre dig your holes. You know, eighteen by twenty four or twenty four by twenty four. Get your fencing ready. Um, when your trees arrive, you got to inspect the roots. They should be moist, and you got to keep them moist. I can't stress this enough. I've had no issues with trees that I've received through UPS, but you want to keep them in a cool dark, well-ventilated uh, area. That's extremely important. And again, I can't stress this enough. Keep those those uh, those roots moist. They don't want to be drenched in a, in a bucket of water. You, I did that on planting day, but there's usually newspaper or other material in there and just keep that water down really good. Keep them moist and dark and cool, but good ventilation. So I just put them in an old barn and it worked out really well for me. Okay, now we're going to talk about planting day. And this is what here, this is a whip and this was same year that I planted this tree and a whip it doesn't have any real branching coming out if it had it'd be called a feather tree so um, you're going to see a couple things here it's straight and it's pretty short and and this has really got a good balance with um, you know the root to, to what's going and it's a ratio so you don't want to if you get your whips you don't want them really long so it might look my gosh you're planting this really small thing I'm going to be so far behind these trees if planted right and taken care of can make up time like you won't be like you can't imagine. And if you have errors with your pruning or whatnot, you can often get around that and the tree will respond in favor. So on your planting day, you wanna keep those roots also covered. Even 10 minutes in the sun or wind is gonna damage those roots. Um, you wanna make sure that that union is gonna be two to four inches above the soil. And obviously you're gonna backfill. And when you put the tree in the ground, you don't wanna J root. Everyone knows what the J looks like and J rooting. You wanna have those roots coming out naturally. Envision them growing in the soil as they naturally would coming down. That's what you really wanna get. On your pre-planting day, I would highly encourage you, if you haven't adjusted all of your, your pH and you're a little bit behind, you can add a shovel full of lime and you can add some ag lime and composted manure, but it's gotta be really good and composted and peat moss, but you gotta mix it really well with the native soil. You can't have these things, it'll, it'll burn the roots, it'll cause other issues, and it's gotta be composted manure. But you know that's really gonna help the tree. And obviously you're gonna firm that up around to remove some air pockets. That's gonna be really important for us. So as you can see, I have some stone, we're gonna talk about that. And you can see some of my fencing in this picture as well. 
And these were my whips back in, I think it was 2009 or 2010. I, I could have been off a little bit, but uh, this is how my trees came. And here's another planting day. And again, after you've planted, you want to slowly water with five gallons. Obviously, we need to water the tree, but it removes the air pockets. This is a great picture. I put this on here. This is a this is a feathered tree. So this picture is likely year two of what you just saw those whips were. But now we've got branches starting. You can see good um, angles with with the uh, the scaffolds there as well. And that's from training and stuff that I have done. So if you didn't buy a feathered tree or a, if you didn't buy a feather tree, you got a whip and it's greater than 30 to 50 inches, you really want to cut it back. And you really want to cut it by, back above a good bud. And this just is going to help anywhere from 30 to 50 is fine, but it's really going to help establish that, that shoot to root ratio. Your roots are the most important thing with your apple. We need to get them growing. We need to get them good. Okay. Um, if, the, if the tree is way too tall and it's going to get a lot of vegetation and the roots aren't there to support it, you're going to have issues. So that's why we do that. And it's going to make itself up. The tree is going to have no issue whatsoever making it up and being a really good producer for you. Um, so staking obviously is extremely essential, extremely. Um, I used conduit and then this black rubber stuff that goes from the conduit to the tree is just rubber polygene. It's cheap. You can buy a whole roll of it for pretty cheap. It's easy to use, interlocks together. It doesn't really damage the bark. It's really good stuff. So you can use a green team post if you want as well, but that's what I did. And then you can see at the bottom, I have a, uh, a, um, a bark protector, if you will, a tree protector. It's a big, heavy wire mesh. It's got like rubber imprinted on it with all of the holes. I use that initially, and then I transition into window screen. And you're going to see that here in a little, in a little bit. Um, highly important to stake that tree, even at this stage. At this stage, everything you do is going to help this tree. That's why the fence is going to go up on the tree immediately. I had my fences all ready to go. I had my posts ready to go. It was pretty simple. Uh, half inch metal conduit. It's it's not the heavy stuff. It's got to be threaded. It's 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 held up fine. I still got pieces around the property doing projects, and it's relatively cheap. They come in ten foot lengths. So that's what I like to use, and I use a lot of UV resistant cable ties, and then also just regular twelve gauge wire for or electric fencing to put stuff together. Here you see the window screen, and the window screen is great. You're going to use a paper, a paper stapler, and you're not going to staple the tree. So envision the fencing, or you got the fencing there. The window screen is going to be below the soil, and then you got your stone mulch. Now, this is pea gravel. This is a tree that I planted probably, oh, four years after my, my orchard first got planted. So this is the method that I used on the other trees, and it works out so much better. The pea gravel is great. Um, crushed limestone is better. It's going to create a weed mat and it's also going to help anchor the tree and help weed competition really just just stay to a minimum so your window screen you're going to cut a piece you want it to go up that first scaffold that's going off to the left you want to make sure it's buried in the soil and then you're going to have your stone mulch over it you're going to staple up the left side which is the seam of the window screen with a window stapler really tight so things can't climb in there and get it on you and then at the top you're going to go all the way towards the central leader and you want to go tight but we're not stapling into the tree as this tree grows, those staples release and you have a constant barrier between your tree and the outside world. And apple, apple borers and those other type of things are absolutely detrimental to trees, especially when they're fresh and young and taste really good. Um, so that is what I did and it worked out really well. It's cheap, you can get this stuff anywhere. And again, this was this was uh, pea stone, but I actually like to use uh, limestone if I have it. It's really good stuff. And again, the weed mats and cardboard and other things that you can use, it promotes voles and other things that are going to damage your trees. So I really like the stone and it's worked out well. It's certainly a little bit of added cost, brought it down with a tractor. And over time, I, I think it's paid for itself. So a little bit there. This was on first planting day. You can see what I did. This was, they're all done. We're all, all set up. We got our enclosures done. Um, I think it was 20 foot of rolled fence. You know, I rolled it out, cut it. I had this all done and they were all wired to go. Plant my tree, plop over, pound some um, conduits in, and it's it's great. It's quick, and now the tree is protected. However, it is extremely difficult for training and pruning. The block enclosure is much easier. I think I did this in 2012, based on my pictures. It was around $500, and all I used was green team post about every 20 to 30 feet. I used a conduit in between. I used welded wire at the bottom. I used chicken wire at the top. Lots of UV resistant cable ties, and I even made myself a door to get in and out. This from the first five years, four years, it was fantastic. Until I got that lower scaffold at or above a deer's head, 
I kept this up and then I removed it. It made it so much easier. I wish I had done this from the beginning before I planted my trees because I wanted to do this and really put everything into it. I'm one of those guys, if I'm gonna do something, I just jump all in and I wanted to do it right. You could easily use the circular enclosures and that would work out fine to you, but I just found this much easier from a maintenance standpoint. Just checking my time here. So weeds, obviously we need to keep the weeds down in this book sitting there with all those weeds. It's not really a good example, but uh, you know, sometimes things get out of control, but weeds are, you gotta keep them down. The moisture in the competition is absolutely critical. Now Gly or generic Roundup, it's generally not re recommended to use um, apple trees around that first year. It's just, there's, there's a lot of literature out there that they just don't really recommend it, that it can stress the tree, cause problems, even if you don't get it on. So I don't know, I, I just have not tended to use it too much. Um, I do use it now, but not that first year. And it, certainly if you're gonna use it, you wanna be cautious of root suckers. Root suckers are with small little trees coming off the roots, usually at the base of your tree, right along that central leader where it goes to the graph union down into your rootstock. So if you get the herbicide on tree bark, leaves, or anything that's growing, off that tree, it can kill it or it can release that back. I have gotten uh, glyphosate on some some suckers. It didn't kill the tree. It kind of looked like it was, you know, kicked for a week or so, and, and then it came back just fine. But just be cautious of that. Fertilizer is definitely going to be a good step to yield better results. Um, you want to do this after it leaves out. So you plant your tree. Hopefully, there's no leaves on it. Sometimes they come. There's some leaves. Not a big deal. Get it in the ground after it's starting. The leaves are starting to pop. You can apply some some fertilizer so and I just did one half pound uh, per the tree initially with my feathered and my whips and the feathers were pretty pretty small feathered trees it wasn't like they were ginormous so and remember your drip line is your root line that's just a good general rule you don't want to fertilize after June this is up from the north and the south guys I would check with your extension office your nursery to see you want a chance for that tree to slow down and not grow into the fall it needs to shut down and uh, apples, for the most part, are, are all rare and pretty much all grown when you get into August. They still, you know, change some stuff and they may not be completely mature and ripe, but, you know, they, they've done a bulk of their work at that point. So you need to be able to shut that tree down. And you can add a quarter to a half a pound of, of fertilizer and just triple 10. Uh, I want to do it about an inch, you know, that rate, quarter to a half um, per inch diameter of the tree truck. And you want to measure that at about one foot off the ground. Watering, I did five gallons every tree that first year, every week. I did monitor my rain gauge. If it was below two inches, I absolutely went down there. It was a lot of labor, but I did it. And I just set my water wagon up with, then I got five gallon buckets. I drilled holes in it and I had hose. I pulled up and brought the hose in there, folded them up and off I went. So it was just a pretty easy thing for me to do. Um, years two and beyond, um, I watered a little bit in year two when we had some drought issues and then I've not really watered. And, and now that I'm in year 10 or 11, or so. Um, this past year was an extreme drought force here in Western New York and, and I did not water at all. And certainly my trees had a few left apples and the apples were a little smaller, but they survived and they looked pretty healthy. Spraying and integrated pest management, uh, integrated pest management. It's highly complex. There's regulations, there's hazards to our health. I would definitely tell you, you gotta read the labels, but check with your extension office and understand your local laws. Imidan and Captan are great things. Uh, to use for apple trees, but unless you have your pesticide license here in New York, you can't use Imidan. So there's things that you can use, but you've got to know what you can and read the safety uh, labels and certainly know your laws. And again, the extension office and some of these resources on the organic IPM would be a great resource for you. Um, so we're going to just get into some, some very, very basic stuff, some spraying concepts. So generally speaking, you don't want to, um, for most people, they're not going to spray until you could do a fungicide when you're when you got flowers. You definitely don't want to use insecticide when the tree is flowering because bees are a friend. So we know bees play a, a huge role and completes pollination. So caution there. If you're going to use an insecticide and you got to read the label, you might pick something up and you don't know there's insecticide in it. Like bonine fruit tree spray actually has seven, which is an insecticide, and has some cattan, which is a fungicide in it. So you really shouldn't use that when, when the trees are, are flowering. Another thing to know, if you're going to put clover, and I have planted clover under my trees, I don't spray a lot anymore. I used to spray quite a bit, and I don't do it anymore. But you got to be mindful. If you're planting clover, thinking about your drift on your spray, it's going to be flowering. The bees are going to be there. We need our bees. So just a little bit of caution there. Um, so just remember, read the labels, know what you're doing, and know what you need to, to check it with. And some of those... Uh, resources that I shared with Cornell will be able to explain a lot of that. Another thing you need to keep in mind that some um, insecticides like seven are actually chemical thinner. It, when you apply it at the right time based on the apple growth, 
And it's at, when it gets, you know, certain round about the size of a ping pong ball or so, and depending on the right um, levels of, of seven that you're using can chemically thin your tree, which is not a bad thing. It's gonna cause some apple drop. Um, too many apples on a tree is problematic. But the main thing that you can do is really to get disease resistant rootstocks varieties and then take care of your maintenance. And that's gonna help you a lot. Training and training, it's definitely an art and science. This is my buddy George in my orchard who came down. Um, training creates good angles. Um, pruning helps airflow and light and also keeps new wood coming. So that's key to remember um, that you need fresh new wood and pruning is going to help with that. But it's also going to help think when things are growing too big. Some trees I can look at and I, I know exactly what I want to do when I'm pruning. And there's other trees I look at and say, holy smokes, where am I going to start here now? So it's definitely an art and science. So I can still learn things about about pruning and I learn things every time I watch a video or, or read a resource out there. But um, it's extremely important to do and it's extremely important to understand. We don't have time to get into a full pruning um, talk this time. Pinching the flowers. The first couple of years, you need to pinch the flowers off. And you're thinking to me, you're crazy, Mike. I want flowers on my tree. No, those first couple of years, you want to develop roots. It's extremely important. So I pinched those off for the first two to three years. And then on year four, I let my trees finally um, develop apples. So air, airflow and sunlight are key. When you look at a tree, think about that. There's a central leader concept, and then there's a lot of talk about small cuts versus big cuts. You generally don't want to cut more than 25% of a, a good tree that's not been dormant for a number of years. Um, older trees, you want to do in one thirds. Dead wood can come off any time on the older trees. But you want to, in my opinion, you want to think sunlight, airflow. When you're looking at something and it's really bad and gnarly and there's just too much going on, if you can take one limb and make a bigger cut versus taking six, it's much better in my opinion. This resource here is probably extremely good for pruning um, your trees. And this is out of our friends of Cornell as well. And these picture from my orchard here with pruning, I believe was just this past, not this past winter, the winter before. So you really want to think about um, your pruning techniques, the central leader concept, and really get a good handle on it. Um, don't want to take 25% more of a tree at a time. The older trees, if you're going to do it, one third at a time. And I just go slow with it. Um, I don't get too, too hasty. It's a lot of work to do when you got 30 trees to do, but really take your time, learn, read the resources, look at the tree and what you have available. If a scaffold that's coming out starts to get really big in diameter of the, of the central leader, that's another indication that that, may, that thing may need to go. You don't want it to get the same, the same size there. So it starts with an idea and a plan. It certainly it's rewarding. It's highly addictive. It can be for your for yourself and also for wildlife. I think that it adds diversity. Again, it creates that central hub for your property. It's no silver bullet. Anything that we do, it's just another tool in our toolbox. So, and again, over on the right, I started everything as a 30 inch whip. Um, these were the original plant the, with limestone with my original trees that I've planted to fill it in. And then this is a picture of the pruned tree that I pruned um, in 2019, the winter of 2019. That's a picture from just this last year. You can see great apples, great structure, light and sunlight, apple pie. When we start making apple pie and my scent free detergent gets out in my house, you know it's deer season. So, so we went from, from that little whip this thing, and now here's my orchard down there below. This fence is just a funnel fence that I put in, just as a technique just based on deer movement, just to kick them a little bit closer to me for archery season. And there's nothing going on here other than there's some clover on that side as well. Those are the, the trees. So you can see this one's been over. That's for some neglect. I'm not proud of it, but uh, it's a pretty good looking orchard. And there, this is from also last year. I do it's, uh, corn and soybeans. I'll probably do the same this year. I just really like that, what it's done to so the structure and the plot, and then also in addition with the apples. So you can see that it's looking, looking pretty good there. So I know we went over a lot of things and we just touched on a lot of stuff and we didn't have enough time to go into do, you know depth on things. I'd be happy to take questions. You know, reach out to me by email. If those links didn't work in the chat, I'd be happy to do that if you want the um uh the article um, picture that has the varieties and also the rootstock um grid in comparison i'd be happy to send those just reach out to me and with that matt i'm going to turn it over to you great job mike we got lots of questions coming in the uh chat section and uh if if you weren't here at the very beginning we got uh um we're asking you to put those in the q and not in the q a but in the chat feature uh kip I'm going to ask the first question uh, off of there. And if you want to, you can go to the emails that you saw a little earlier. We got one real early. 
Um, one from Jason Crichton asked, uh, how important is pruning? Can uh, trees bear fruit without pruning? I know you touched on pruning there at the end, but if you don't prune, are they going to bear fruit? Can you answer that? Yes. I mean, most trees, you'll, you'll find dormant trees on your property that have been touched forever and, and they've gone barren, but you can plant a tree and not prune it and not do any maintenance and you get apples. It will eventually fruit. And some of the stuff that happens with the apples when they're growing and they get too heavy and they're breaking, you know, it's kind of nature's self. You know, it's nature's kind of correcting itself, if you will. It's going to do a little self pruning, but then it opens up the disease to the tree to disease and, and other problems. So if you can prune, it's much better to take care of your trees. It's easy to plant a tree. It's hard to take care and time consuming to take care of an apple tree and do an extremely good job at it. But you can definitely get benefit if you don't have the time. Thanks, Mike. Kip, you got a question? Yeah, great job, Mike. I'm still trying to catch up here. That was a tremendous amount of information. Uh, very, very good. Uh, your passion clearly comes through with doing this, Mike, and uh, man, that, that was great. Uh, question we have here, this is relative to, to pruning as well. Um, it's a two-part question. I'll let you answer the first part and the second part will be very quick. Um, just provide, and you did some of this in your talk, you provided some apple uh, pruning tips. Um, real quickly, um, hit the, the highlights again, Mike, for folks with regard to if they're stepping up to their tree to prune them, what are the first things you're looking for or advice you can give folks? And I know that that's a whole seminar in itself, but uh, quickly, what are some apple pruning or some tips folks need to know if they're going to step up and start pruning some trees? Sure. So it's going to depend on what kind of tree and how old it is. If you're just planting a tree that first year, you're not going to really do any pruning. You're going to do some training. You're going to keep the, the angles of the branch coming out from that central leader good. You don't want them going straight up like a, uh, um, like a V. You want them going at a, at a better angle out. Um, and then, you know, on year two, you can start, start to prune a little bit, but in the early years, you want all those green leafy um, limbs out there to really grow and help, help, the, help the roots. So those first couple of years, we don't do too much. And then starting off, when you get into year four, if you just started I'm using an M111 or an M7, I would start to think, when can you start to take the lower scaffolds? Outside of that, I would look at the tree and think of the concept air and light. That's your friend. Air is gonna help a disease. And then sunlight obviously just helps the tree. I would start with those concepts. The other concept I like, rather than make 16 million small cuts, I'd rather do a larger cut. If it's gonna open something up and it kind of makes sense. So remember, you know, there's lots of different principles with, with pruning. Probably when your trees are established, not taking more than 25%, um, the timing is crucial. You don't want to prune in the summertime. If you've got an older tree, um, you can definitely do dead wood anytime. But you need to prune in the cold months of January, February, and, and somewhat of March. I, I wouldn't do it this week. So that anytime you're going to prune a tree, the tree is going to respond. And if you prune in the summer months or in the growing season, you're just going to get water shells. You know, they're just, they're, they're sprouts or woody things that go straight up. It's not going to really create much fruit. It's just going to be a hassle. It's going to block things off. You're going to have to cut those off. Some people do cut those off in the summer, but you have to remember everything that you do with pruning a tree is going to have an effect. And where your wood comes from is, or your apples come from is that two and three year old wood. Okay. Second half of that. Do you, are you also pruning crab apple trees too? So Apples tend to be more wild. I have I haven't planted a lot of those. I just have the one the one crab apple, the gold rush, and I I do um, I definitely prune that tree. I also have planted three pear trees. Those are up top, and those um, are doing well, but not as good as the apple trees. They've been a little bit slower. So I would say pears are definitely not in my experience thing. But um, if you have a crab apple tree, you could certainly you know prune that and keep it healthy. Um, I would think about the same concepts: remove dead wood, airflow, light would be key. Um, so that's what I would definitely start. Okay. Good deal. What you got, Matt? I'd say it's already uh, 7.59. I guess we're going to, I know that we have a ton of questions. So let's, I, let's, I think... uh, let's run through a few here. Um, you know, if folks want to get off, uh, they can jump off, but uh, there, okay. there's a bunch of good stuff. And uh, Mike, maybe you can uh, answer some of these and maybe a little more of a rapid fire. We won't make you give us uh, the full extended version of the answers, but uh, we'll see if okay. we can at least make it through some of these and, uh, and answer some questions for folks. All right. Well, well uh, you tell me when you're ready and we'll give the prize away, but here's a good quick one for you, Mike. Uh, Kim asked about rootstock, your preference, dwarf, dwarf semi-dwarf, or full size. I know you talked about rootstock early on, but uh, well, of the three, preference. Semi-standard, which is M111, or a semi-dwarf, which is an M7. Definitely not a dwarf. So semi-standard or semi 
dwarf. So the semi dwarf is like 60% of the a standard apple tree. And then a semi standard can be almost 85, so a little bit higher. I mean, do 100% of that. So you want these trees to be big and tall to get over top of the deer's, deer's head. So, all right, Kip, to you. All right, fertilizer, Mike. Uh, when do you start fertilizing the trees? And what do you prefer? Are you more of a liquid, a granular, or a spike guy? I've only used uh, granular. Um, I've spread it just on the ground. I do it after leaf out. So when the trees are starting to pop and getting green is when I do it. I've also done some heal in method, which is with your shovel and you put some in and close it up. You know, you gotta definitely fertilize, but obviously you're gonna have to remember that's gonna help your weed competition. It's gonna make it grow. Um, you don't wanna fertilize up here in the North when you get past June. I would even prefer not to do it, you know, the second week in June, just because you wanna have that tree an opportunity to slow down from its, from its growth spike. Getting ready for winter. Okay. Good deal. Right. Matt? Like, hypothetical, if you had your, your druthers, would you rather stumble upon a, uh, an uh, older trees that need some pruning and, and releasing, or would you rather start from scratch with new plants? Both, because it's already there. I mean, I have an apple tree in my property. It's got to be 90 feet tall. tall. I can't get to the top to do any pruning. It's just ginormous. It's the craziest thing I've ever seen. I got a lot of old apple trees, you know, probably planted by either a cow or a bird. Um, and I've definitely released those and done a lot of work on them and they're producing as well. But taking my block orchard and putting it where I want to from a strategic standpoint, how I want to hunt and use the property, man, you know, it's, it's some money, it's some time. Definitely it's not cheap and it's especially on time too. If you want to do it right, again, if you want to just throw a tree in the ground, you can do that. But if you really want to take care of your trees, it's time consuming. It was a passion of mine. I almost went into business in the apple orchard business. Um, it's great stuff. Maybe that'll be my retirement gig. I don't know. But um, but definitely do both. I would love to have both, but I would definitely, if you want to have just a place to hunt or maybe a place for the kids to hunt or, or whatever, and you have a good spot on your on your property, I would definitely consider, you know, throw in 10 to 30 trees. You don't have to do them all at once. You can space it out so it's more, and that's probably the preferred thing to do, you know, because it's a lot of work initially, you know, getting those holes dug and everything else. So You skirted the um, answer, Mike, but that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, let's see, let's uh, let's each, each ask one more, and then we'll okay. do the prize giveaway. So right. uh, there's a question here relative to uh, resources, and Mike gave uh, a couple resources that he recommended uh, in his talk. Uh, this talk will be available on our YouTube, so you can go back and see those again if you didn't get them written down. And uh, it's also in the chat here. Some of those are available, so you can grab those now or see that again later. But uh, Mike, what's your thoughts on painting trunks? Something you recommend or not? You can do that. There's a mixture that you have to do, and I believe it's some white paint and maybe some some rock mud, and you can put also some um, insecticide in there. I'd have to. I haven't done it, but I know the guys that have. You could certainly do that. It would definitely be pretty easy. You know, they actually just mop it on the tree with a with a hand sponge, watch your skin. But um, I know guys that have done that, but I have not personally done that. You know, in the links again, anyone wants them, certainly you know, throw me an email. All the questions they get recorded, I will try to you know, get back to people or, or try to address questions as we can, but certainly send me an email. You know, I will get back to you. I can send you those links and send you those resources. Absolutely. So. All right. Here's my last question and the last one. And then anybody else, you can reach out to Mike at Mike at deer association.com through email. If you have another, another question, there's a fertilizer question. I know Kip already asked one, but this has to do with after the first year, uh, what's, what's kind of the general thought. Uh, he, the person says I was told, uh, to fertilize when planting, but what do you do after that first year? Yep, I try to fertilize annually, um, and I try to do um, a quarter pound per inch. I add a quarter round to my half a pound um, per inch of the diameter of the of the tree trunk, one foot above the ground. So that's what I do. And my trees now are probably oh I don't know, they're they're, they're pretty they're pretty beefy now. So I don't even really get too specific. I just kind of you know, put my fertilizer down. And I would say for my 30 trees, you know, I'm probably putting down maybe, and this is triple 10, you know, 50 to 75 pounds. So I check my pH. I think pH is critical, but your apple trees need, need fertilization for sure. Every so, year. Yep. If you really want to get technical, you can read about leaf analysis. You can send your leaves off if you really want to get nerdy with it. But I don't, I don't think that's necessary for what we're, you know, if you're a commercial orchard, that's a different thing, but. All right. Thanks, Mike. Lots of good questions, folks. Um, reminder, Nick, Nick, uh, encourage you to join. I hope you all join uh, if you can. And I mentioned the, uh, the sweepstakes earlier, the St. Patty's Day sweepstakes. Uh, that ends on March 15th, so just over six days left. Uh, the drawing will be the 19th. Uh, there are 20, 50, 
and hundred dollar options for hundred bucks, you get 35 entries and there's firearms and Milwaukee tools and all kinds of goodies that you'll win. And there's a bunch of, a bunch of drawings, part of that sweepstakes. And uh, Kip, I think entered the, uh, the link a little bit earlier for the St. Patty's day sweepstakes there. So Kip, what about next month? What do we got coming up? We have uh, another Habitat one next month, Dr. Marcus Lashley from the University of Florida. He runs their, their entire deer and habitat program there. Is going to be talking about burning with a purpose, uh, the complex relationship between deer and fire. So uh, th this is used in prescribed fire, you know, wisely to accomplish the exact uh, objectives you're trying to from a deer end. So uh, that'll be uh, that Monday night. Join us there. All the other questions, thank you for asking these questions. It has been great uh, discussion here. Anybody whose question didn't get answered or if you have something else you still want, I just put Mike's email up there again. It's mike at deerassociation.com. Please email him directly. Um, Mike won't see a list of all of the stuff that the chat that's on here that didn't get answered tonight. So if there's something else you ask, just reach out to him after this and uh, he will be glad uh, to answer your question. So with that, Matt, we're up to a fun part here. All right, let's give away a prize. So uh, trying to think of what the prize could be for tonight and uh, got a preview of the presentation. Saw lots of good trail camera images in there uh, with some big bucks that Mike growing around his orchard that he's been growing. And I uh, thought hey, we haven't given a book out yet this year. So I'm going to give out the uh, deer camera book, um, deer camera, the science of scouting uh, from the, the National Deer Association. So I'm going to ask a question. You're going to type in the answer in the chat feature, the first answer that uh, comes correctly on there, we'll get this prize out and we will mail it to you. Uh, so I could get real complicated and ask about what the rootstock number is for the most whatever, <laughs> uh, but I'll keep it simple. Uh, what, uh, how many grams of protein does one media apple, medium sized apple provide? Oh, there we go. I see it was one gram of protein. William Kibler got it. It was the first one. I figured I'd keep it short and sweet. Uh, so William, uh, please email me at matt at deerassociation.com, matt at deerassociation.com, and we'll send you that book. I uh, hope you all enjoyed it. Kip, any last words? Man, that was a good time tonight. I enjoyed this a lot. So uh, very good job, Mike. I appreciate uh, the range of all the information you provided here. And uh, I think that there were some great questions. Uh, that's a really good mark of, of how interested folks are. So thank you, everybody. Matt, I've had fun. I hope you've had too. And uh, I did. we'll do it again same time next month. Perfect. Have a good night, folks. Good night, good night everybody. everybody.